Hey, good morning, hacksters. It is my favorite time of the week. This week we have Christina here on uh, to talk about the Circle Phone. Good morning, Christina. Good morning, Alex. Thank yep. you for having me. My pleasure. I've been looking forward to this for so long because we've seen you out in the field for ages with various iterations of the Circle Phone, and now mm -hmm. you're doing this Kickstarter. Can you tell us about it? Yes, so we've been waiting for a long time. We were actually supposed to launch uh, pre-COVID, but um, you know, it, it just didn't seem relevant at the time because there was so much going on in the world, and there were protests here that our team wanted to participate in for Black Lives mm. Matter, and so it just, uh, yeah, so it kind of took a back seat uh, for many months. But we're really excited to have it, and. We're also excited because while COVID was going on, uh, while the lockdown was ensuing, we hosted an enclosure contest to design the enclosure for uh, the Circle Phone. So I'm ex I'll be excited to talk about that a little bit more today as well. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I think the enclosure is one of the most unique parts about your phone, and we're totally going to uh, let's just pull that up right now. So um, let me pull up your website. So here's the Kickstarter, the Circle Phone 2.0. And as we were saying, this is the 2.0 version, and there's some very interesting differences between the first one, which we're, we'll totally get to. And there's also some really interesting, ah, like the dual headphone jacks, I think are one of the yes. most interesting parts of this phone. But that's not what we're talking about right now. We're talking about the uh enclosure and you actually have a an faq on your website so this might be a good place to start because mm -hmm. uh you know people who are just becoming aware of this phone what mm -hmm. is the deal with the enclosure tell us about that so the enclosure is exciting in that you know to make a round phone you have a round display but you have to fit the cameras in too and mm. um of course there are displays that are available for example samsung uses a display where the uh camera peeks through the display but that's a right. really expensive uh display and we're fortunate just even to find a round display and not only a round display most Round displays that are available today are, you know, 280 by 280 or 360 by 360. Um, right. But ours is 800 by 800. And so what that means is that even though it doesn't sound like a high resolution compared to all of the numbers that you hear today with mobile phones, um, but to the naked eye, you don't see a whole lot of difference. So at that 800 by 800 resolution, it's high enough to see a lot of your graphics, a lot of your videos, your images on Instagram. So it really makes them look lovely. I'm really happy to have that. Sweet. And uh, speaking of the enclosure, you have this uh, part of the FAQ where you talk about uh, how, like, if I'm interested in protecting my phone with a case, you have... Yes. A couple of yes. different answers for that. One's for the screen and one's for the case. So, Yes. So typically for uh, a typical smartphone, it's flat and on, on the face of the phone. And so when you drop it, the first thing that breaks is the screen. On the circle phone itself, we actually have a rim around the edge. Uh, and because of this rim around the edge, when you drop it, it protects the screen from breaking. So that's one advantage that you have there. So oh, you, could you show you, us that again? Sorry. Sure, sure. Yeah, so it's nice. You can see the edge here and it's protecting the screen. So when you drop it flat, it doesn't break. So right. the second thing that's exciting about the enclosure is that we share out at the end of the, each campaign, we share out the files, the 3D print files for the enclosure. So you can print the enclosure in any color that you want. So, and any material that you want. So as long as you have the filament for it, you can produce it yourself. So what that means is that instead of having a bulky exterior, uh, you know, protector on the back of your phone, if you drop this and it cracks, you can just 3D print one yourself. And even if you don't have your own 3D printer, you can farm that out to other places like 3D Hubs, which I think is now called, I think it's called Hub now. They changed their mm. name. But if you go to 3D Hubs, it, it redirects you. Shapeways, um, there are other 
uh, 3D printing services out there. So, and they have a plethora of materials to choose from. So it's exciting to be able to do that to yourself and choose your own enclosure. Yeah, and you have not only the files up here on GitHub, but you also have these full uh, instructions for tips for printing and which types of screws you need. Just in Thank case you, you for highlighting them. that. <laughs> so great. <laughs> Most people don't know that we have a certification for the enclosure itself so that uh, we are uh, huge proponents of open hardware. And so we do have an open hardware cert certificate for and number and uh, certification for the external enclosure. We're very proud of that. Whoa, so both, both for the 2G version of our phone that we released several years ago and then also for the 4G version as well. That's awesome. What was that process like for you? So quick. So I was really amazed when I went through it for the 2G version. It had been a number of years since I had designed that. So I only shared out the STLs for the certification process. And so they sent me an email back and they said, we actually need the files that you can use to modify uh, oh, the yeah. form. So, so I sent in the step. Uh, files after that for the 2G version, and then it was immediately uh, approved. And I was shocked, surprised, and delighted at how quick the process was. So that when I went to, so, so I actually did the uh, 2G version because I was just learning, this was years ago, uh, learning how to do uh, 3D models. So I was Ooh. using SketchUp at the time. And uh, since then, I've progressed uh, pretty far in Autodesk Fusion 360. And that's what I designed both the um, 2020 version of our 4G enclosure and our 2021 version of our 4G enclosure. And our 2021 uh, 4G enclosure was inspired by Will, uh, Wes Melora. And he was the finalist for our enclosure contest last summer. So uh, he really brought everything together in balancing both the top and the bottom of the phone so that it was a, just a uniform oval. And he's been working on the injection mold uh, uh, files for our final um, mass production of the circle phone. And um, so based on his vision, I created the 3D print model that's shared out and certified. That's so cool. And it mm -hmm. looks really beautiful. Thank Are, you. Can, you, can you print your own bezel as well? Is it the back yeah. part alone? Yes, absolutely. You can print. Ooh. In fact, I think I have, mm, I'm sorry, I don't have them on my desk, but we just uh, printed <laughs> to be able to show people that they could print in different colors. We printed in oh, black, yeah. we printed in blue and um, yeah, you can print the, the black bezel on the face as well. You can even use the modifiable files to put bunny ears on the top oh, right. if you want, <laughs> like cute ears on your circle phone, um, a tail, whatever you want to do. Uh -huh. so. I love those ideas. It seems like it might mess with the ability to put it in your pocket. <laughs> That's true. It absolutely, absolutely will. But maybe you could make, you know, snap yeah. on, snap off. Oh, um, yeah. Or you can make it out of fabric and have like a little attachment <laughs> way of doing it. Yes. Um, you, could, you could like print it out of stretchy or flexy stuff. Oh, yes. there's so many options. You have such an interesting um, aspect of your company where you're really focused on sustainability and recyclable and compostable materials. So uh, it informs both how you're making the enclosures and how you recommend people, other people use them. So how, what are kind of uh, steps have you taken and materials have you chosen? Uh, yes. That. So, uh, and we've talked about this on our blog quite extensively. So I was looking for a place to, you know, kind of publish all of the research that we've gone into uh, to, to kind of produce uh, what we have today. So we actually use corn-based PLA for the enclosure itself. So even when we injection mold, so PLA is remarkable in that it's a material that you can both 3D print with filament and you can injection mold with the pellets. So yeah. we've, we've looked at all of those different materials for the enclosures. 
Another material that we did extensive research on was TPU. So TPU is really interesting. It's a very familiar phone case feel because mm. most of the phone protective cases for smartphones up until about 2017, 2018 were made of TPU. So it was that soft rubbery kind of feel and texture to it. And we did think about doing the entire phone in that material. It's super shiny. It can be super shiny, especially when you injection mold it, mm. but it's a little bit too soft. So we actually used recycled TPU for the buttons and the buttons are made out of recycled ski boots. That's so, so cool. Isn't that cool? It's it's really interesting. It's really soft TPU. So there's different uh, a hard on the hardness scale. There's different um, uh, degrees of hardness for TPU, and it's one of the softer TPUs that you can use. Didn't you say there's also some that are made out of like Audi dashboards or yes. something? Yes. So, <laughs> so cool. that was another material that we uh, researched extensively. So you can actually, most consumer electronics are made out of nylon. So not mm. the smartphones, but like your remote controls. Let's see, I have a remote control right here are made out of uh, nylon. And it's a very familiar uh, type of plastic that's made in consumer materials. It's it's still petroleum based, but you can find sources that you can reuse. And one of those sources is Audi dashboards or Volvo dashboards. Um, of course, when you say Audi, you know, it, it just sounds so, <laughs> so <laughs> like much shortier. So mm. exactly. So they're made solidly of this black nylon. And so if you just grind up the Audi dashboard into these pellets, then you can extrude it into filament to be 3D printed or injection or just pellets uh, for the injection molding. And so we have looked into uh, using nylon in that fashion, but to be able to set up a grinding system, to be able to grind all of those particulates down is quite expensive. It can get up to about $40,000, depending on the type of equipment that you buy. Mm. Uh, yes. And so we've known places that have invested that that amount of money uh, to be able to recycle uh, these types of materials. And it can be done on a larger scale. But for our purposes, it's easier for us just to uh, buy it from a facility that already does that for us. Mm. And you have mentioned on your blog, this is an amazing blog, by the way, uh, the circlephone.com slash blog we'll put a link to it underneath but you really go into everything about like you're talking about the nylon here and you're saying oh i tried this but after trying out the ones like from discarded fishing nets which is awesome also <laughs> yes. because like that's you know huge source of ocean pollution uh and then you're like well i tried it out but i found that it was too brittle for now and just like the fact that you're sharing all of these processes uh in in the service of trying to be a sustainable company and ah it's so good Thank you. Thank you. One of the exciting things that we haven't been able to financially uh, venture into, but is, yes, exactly, the lithium mm. batteries. So I'm really looking forward to the day when we can produce at scale recycled lithium batteries. And we, we are actually at that point right now. The the only blocking issue is the lack of vision <laughs> on, mm. on some parts because we can actually produce recycled lithium batteries more cheaply than re than um, a mining the lithium ore from the ground. So there's actually Amazing. more lithium ore in a ton of smartphones than there is in a ton of lithium ore. Wow. So. And it takes so much water to be able to extract the lithium from that ore that it, it just uses a lot of our natural resources. So to be able to harvest the lithium batteries, which have already been manufactured and harvest them at scale and be able to translate those into recycled batteries is not only good for our smartphones, but it's also good on a larger scale, for example, for electric vehicles. So 
there's going to be a huge boom in electric vehicles in the next couple years. And I would have to say like two to four years. And we need batteries for those vehicles. And even though there is a huge concern about the chip shortage and we're all experiencing yeah. it now, I think the bigger concern is going to be for lithium batteries. We're going to exceed our demand for lithium uh, great, and it'll be greater than the supply that we have available right. just from mining the lithium itself. So, plus there's human rights concerns in there with the lithium mining as well. Yes, indeed. And so, uh, there is some research going into um, uh, just to address the water issue, mm. and the Gates Foundation has invested. A serious amount of capital. I think the company they invested in was in South America, but they use a fraction of the amount of water that is normally used in the mining. And why that's important is that when you're not extracting or not using up so much water from mm -hmm. the local community, then you're not draining the water that they would use for crops. Right. and keeping people alive. So it's really the human factor, not only the uh, workers' rights, but also the community surrounding the lithium mines uh, is impacted greatly by the use, the large use of water. That's amazing. And you have this aspect of your company as well, you're, where you're a social purpose corporation. Could you tell us what that, what that means? Yes, yes. So we were looking for, uh, so of course, you know, our main concern is the environment. We really want to be able to produce a smartphone, which is as environmentally friendly as possible. So mm -hmm. being able to simply make the enclosure uh, biodegradable is really exceptional. Unfortunately, uh, commercial composting is not available really outside of our microcosms, like on the right. West Coast and the East Coast, like mm -hmm. the rest of the world doesn't have uh, composting. But when you think about it, even if it goes to landfill throughout the world, at least it's being able to be degraded to some extent faster than a petroleum based plastic. So those yeah. are things that we look for. But the second aspect that we focus on is the right to repair. So mm. to be able to repair your device extends the lifetime of the device. And it also uh, makes you more familiar with those that device's features. And so for example, for our smartphone, you can order from us an extra display that you can pop in or pop out. You can order oh, extra cool. cameras. Yeah. So oh, amazing. And, yeah, and so you can pop those features in and out. And uh, one of the other kind of our colleagues on the scene is called the Fairphone, and they have really done a good job in making, uh, you know, the cameras module, uh, camera modules to be able to pop in and pop out to be able to ex extend uh, the lifespan of your phone. And they're well known for that. Unfortunately, our company is not as well known for that, but we we do that as well, and we were kind of born at the same during the same year that they were born as well. Right. So we just thing. haven't been making a lot of noise about that. Thank you for showing that. So I'm a big fan of the Fairphone and also the Fairphone team. Um, being in the mobile phone industry, I have lots of favorites uh, for right. smartphones uh, because I just you know, they're our number one device. And so being able to see what kind of independent mobile phone makers bring to the table is really exciting to me. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. I wanted to point out one thing with the composting you were mentioning earlier. This was something that I dove dug into like a couple of years ago because I was curious about it myself in terms of like 3D printing. And when you're getting into 3D printing, you're using a lot of filament for support as well. Uh, yeah, that, that just gets thrown away. And yes. I was like, okay, so it, PLA is compostable, but as you were saying, uh, you can only really compost it in commercial composting environments because it has to reach a certain temperature that in DIY home composting doesn't really work. And so you can, it's cool that you can like also like reheat it and reuse it as a thermoplastic, but also you can uh, 
you can compost it commercially. It's so cool. That that's a really good point. And for commercial composting, the reason why that's so important is you really need six feet wide. You need a six foot cube to be mm. able to do commercial composting. And a lot of people just don't have that in their backyard. So you need to have six feet wide, six feet tall, six mm. feet deep to be able to create the heat that's required to be able to break down the PLA. And so we're really fortunate to have it in our local area ourselves so that all the prototypes that we've printed out, we can uh, commercially compost. But yes, it, it's hard when it's not available uh, worldwide. But even if it's not, a, like I said, if, even if it's not available worldwide, you still have a lot of the PLA going into landfill. And that's still um, as long as it's six, it's as long as it's a six foot cube, um, then it does have a chance. Awesome. Let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about the phone itself. Um, so you've got this is your second iteration of this phone, and some features that you have are persisted across the different versions. So this dual headphone jack, can you tell us about that? Yes. So we've interviewed in person more than 1000 people about their smartphone that they have in their pocket. So, you know, what do you like about your smartphone? What do you hate about your smartphone? What do you think about smartphones in general? You know, those kinds of things. And one of the things that millennials in particular said to us, they expressed a sense of sadness that everyone was so heads down in their smartphone and focus on their smartphone and they were not connecting to the people to the left and the right of them or even you know standing around them and so i think millennials in particular were aware of this because you know in their childhood it was not like that like all of their friends didn't have phones and then it was only when they reached you know after high school or college that they got their first smartphone. So they were able to experience what it's like to not have smartphones in your lives and to actually connect with the people around you. And so then when everyone, you know, got their smartphone and they were so heads down with their smartphone and not connecting with the people around them, it really created this sense of kind of despair amongst millennials and so I thought one of the, the things that we could add that was pretty simple to add on the hardware side was just another headphone jack so that you can share your videos and your music with the person who's sitting right next to you. And so we had a lot of consternation going into lockdown about this feature because you know, <laughs> during right. COVID, you know, we're trying to stay away. Right. But in reality, you're with, you're locked down with your COVID buddies. You know, you see just a handful of people, and and those people you've spent more time with because you're not you know gallivanting around, <laughs> you know, seeing tons of people, and so you're actually spending more quality time with this handful of people that are around you, and so you're actually more apt to to share your music and videos with the person right next to you because they're with you continuously. Yeah, speaking as a millennial, I find that one of the most frustrating things is, is that more of these phones are taking away the headphone jacks. Like I have an iPad that has no headphone jack. There's lots of new phones that have no headphone jack. And that's like, you're going the opposite direction. And so many people are so frustrated that you can't just use a TRS yes. uh, or TRRS cable anymore. And like, you know, the, just sharing that stuff you have iphones where you like you can't charge and listen to music at the same time it's just absurd so i love that you're going in the opposite direction with this and i'm totally Thank one of those people who like that. yeah i'm totally one of those people who like wants to share the music with the people next to them because and i was so it. impressed that you just whipped out trs i was like <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's really amazing so for people who don't know that's tip ring ring sleeve mm. and the reason why that's important is on your uh audio jack gosh do i even have one uh so let's see that if i can pull this one out so <laughs> for those who have not been focused on this <laughs> in a while or need a <laughs> refresher or haven't even 
uh, learned it yet. So of course, this is the tip. And then you have these two rings that are in the middle. And then you have the sleeve. And depending on your system, they control different aspects. So fortunately, we've gotten to the point where in this day and age, most uh, tip ring ring sleeves control the same things. But actually, uh, before 2012, uh, there were actually different headphone jacks for uh, the iPhone than th there were for the Android phones. So um, you had to really pay attention which one you had. Um, yeah, and that was that was um, frustrating because you would stick your headphone jack in hoping it was the right one and it wasn't the right one. So fortunately, we've kind of all come to a decision <laughs> on what it should be. And they're all kind of um, followed the same pattern these days. But uh, it's, um, it's interesting to learn, you know, what each one controls. So, yeah. So here's actually a little deeper dive on that. Um, mm -hmm. so TRS are usually like stereo audio and TRRS are usually, they have like a head, a uh, microphone aspect as well often, which is why they have that extra contact. Are both of the ports on the circle phone, are those both TRRS? So you can use a yes. microphone either what? Yes, that's and so that's cool. an excellent question. Yes, they're both TRRS, and um, because of that, uh, we're able to have more functionality. Yeah, so. you could like be on a group call with someone and have two people next to each other and both have like not terrible audio. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> so indeed, cool. indeed. And I was surprised. At, <laughs> even though I designed them, I was like, you know, surely there's going to be some degradation here, but um, we haven't experienced any. So. It's Amazing. been fabulous. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. Well, now we're getting to the middle of the interview, and there is a okay. new initiative that we're doing. We're sharing with Spark Fun called the Spark Fun Rapid Round. And <laughs> Spark <laughs> Fun! Yeah. yeah. So it's a rapid <laughs> series of questions about rapid prototyping. And obviously, this is also a prototype because I forgot about the way that the display goes and how it is not very compatible with cameras. But we're going to have <laughs> a minute to answer as many questions about okay. rapid prototyping as possible. Are you ready? Yes. All right, let's go. <laughs> okay, so your biggest idol or most respected inspirational person? Uh, David Bellis. Oh, I'll ask about that later. Best sustainable material to 3D print with? PLA. Awesome. Most beneficial trade show or conference? Oh. I loved Maker Fairs when they existed. Yeah. Um, and then for my industry, uh, Mobile World Congress and CES. Oh, okay, cool. Are the places to be. Good to know. Uh, best prototyping hack. So work. <gasps> best prototyping hack. If you make a mistake, <laughs> you can solder later. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, next device that you would revamp after. The oh, program. can I can I add to that? Oh, yeah. I love soldering paste. I love, <laughs> love, love soldering paste. It's sticking it in the reflow oven. What so a game changer. Yes. Seriously. Cool. So after after the phone, what would you revamp next? I would, of course, love to work on our 5G phone. And we would also like to do different shapes. The hexagon, octagon, heart-shaped phone, and star-shaped phone. Oh, I love that. Oh, octagon, hexagon. Hexagons were so huge like a couple of years ago and they're also, I still love them. I think that they had like a moment and it's kind of fading, but I think that there's such a classic element of tech design that like really feels yes. sort of cyberpunk and futuristic and yes. they'll never be over. Hexagons are forever. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think so too. Tell us about the circle design of your, and we'll wrap around to some of those questions you answered again. I'm curious about David Bellis, for example. But mm -hmm. um, tell us about why you chose a circle. It's a phone for non-rectangular people, right? Yes, but our hand shape is actually based <laughs> for a more round device. Right. So when you think about it, you think about things that you pick up in nature, and those are you know round stones, round oh. pebbles, and yeah, it's just, it's more comfortable in the hand. You'll notice when you hold a rectangular phone, your pinky will get really tired, especially if you have to like video conference someone for a long time, or you're watching a particular video and you have no place to rest your phone, you know, those kinds of things. So um, it's it's just more comfortable in the, uh, in the hand. Also the round display, there's a lot of scientific research behind this that when you crop an image 
in a round format, it's more eye-catching. So you're yeah. actually making your images and videos pop, really look good. And the one of the things that you may have noticed is that your social media, media avatar photo, so Ooh. your little profile photo used to be a square. So about four years ago, and they changed it. All of them have changed to a round cropped shape. And that's because it's more eye catching. That's so cool. Um, I, I think I actually have like a little callus on my little finger from holding up my phone. <laughs> totally yes, accurate. yes, it, yes, it absolutely is. There's a lot of hand fatigue there. And so mm. Um, people do worry about the round display, seeing the bits in the corners. And we, right. have, we have software, which actually you can resize your applications. So just like a computer desktop, exactly, this is it. So you can use freeform mode. And what free, freeform mode does is that it reduces the size of the application. And then you can modify the size of the application, both sideways and uh, top to bottom. And you can even move it around your desktop. So just like a computer desktop, you can access icons which are to the side, you know, below, above the application window. You can continue watching your video and open up other applications. It's really, really convenient. So, and even when it's enlarged, you can go ahead and click the enlarge, uh, which is up in the right-hand corner, just like you would expect on, oh, nice. <laughs> on your desktop apps. But um, if you uh, enlarge the application to full size, your eye actually is drawn to what is in the center of the display. So whether you're reading a book or you're watching oh. a video, your eye is right there in the center. And so you really are not disturbed by not being able to see the corners uh, intermittently. Like if you want to see the corners, you can. If you need to access that information, you can. But uh, most of the time, you're just like, what a gorgeous display and my video looks fantastic and my Instagram images look fantastic. You know, like what? <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful experience and I highly recommend it. That's so cool. You know, that ties in with something that I've heard about speed reading is it's the same thing about how your eyes don't, yes. they're, it's less fatiguing to go in a circle than it is to go from side to side. And there's actually a, an app that I had downloaded for my phone that like puts all the text in a little circle in the middle because your eye is able to just sort of like take oh. it all in at once. And oh, oh, it would wow. be really interesting to like try a Kindle style e-reader app on a round uh, display. That'd be so interesting. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting. So I'll have to I'll have to check that out after the podcast. Maybe I can like upload a video on that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more about the journey from version one to version two. So in twenty sixteen, yes. you did a previous version. Tell us about it. Yes. So twenty sixteen, we had the two G version, and honestly, I had to slap that together as a tester for to to get feedbacks for our 4g version but people started asking to buy it and i was like ah. what <laughs> like, please you know the the screen's only the size of a postage stamp and uh you know it's just <laughs> in it we had to clip the the display so that you know it had a bezel on it to cover up the corners and things like that but no people really really liked it and so they saw it as, uh, because in 2016, the age that a child was getting their first mobile phone was dropping from the age of 12 down to the age of six in places like Australia. So ah. because of this, parents wanted kind of a phone to introduce to their children that would not be have the social media on it that you know a full-fledged 4g phone would have and so they were comfortable with them having a 2g kind of flip phone and it was exciting to be able to pair it with our class so we offered the you know we would send it to you as a kit for 150 dollars or you could come in and take a class at a makerspace around the country. We went to, uh, we had so six cool. different makerspaces around the country that we uh, offered it at. And you could come in for the class and not one person chose the ship it version. 
Huh. All of our backers chose the in-person class version. So yeah. I think because it it may be a little daunting for people to assemble, you know, like to conceptualize assembling their own phone. But the 2G version, you could snap together in less than five minutes. So if you knew what you were doing, you could do it in less than two. But um, right. yeah. Is this the, we, were you working with the seed refund kit? Like I see in yes. Yes. Oh, okay. So I didn't design those modules. We just ordered all of those modules from uh, Seed Studio. We uh -huh. offered the refund kit and we offered our enclosure uh, in the class. And then we showed people how to modify the kit cool. so that it could fit inside the enclosure. And we taught them how to, to install a dial tone and, you know, kind of do a little bit of the programming. So it's Arduino based, uh, the refund kit create modules mm -hmm. are, are doing based uh, and the exciting thing about it is that once you were done you know using the phone you could use the modules in other hacking projects so other mm, make, yeah. so make other um uh devices so you could make like a pet collar for tracking your pet yeah. and yeah it was really cool and they even had like a breakout they had several breakout boards that you could um, solder your own like LEDs and resistors too. So it was uh -huh. so cool. awesome. Yeah, you it was expand really... with your own sensors and whatever. Yes, um, unfortunately, the classes we could not scale, oh, right? And yeah. so um, that just wasn't something that we could offer, um, you know, beyond uh, that year. But um, since then, I've taken the refund kit create and to many maker fairs, geek girl con several years, um, and various run various workshops. So I've been able to instruct uh, over 200 people uh, through these various workshops, how to create their own phone. And then also at our uh, university here in Seattle, the University of Washington, I was able to partner with one of the capstone projects. And hmm. so electrical engineering students were able to create their own mobile phones uh, in that program. And that was exciting because we did the, you know, uh, the 2G circle phone the first 20 minutes. And then uh -huh. we did the um, uh, Adafruit also has their own the 2G, 3G. Yes, ah. the Fona phone. And so we did that, you know, the following class day, because that's only soldering five parts. And then um, for the few few more weeks, we worked on David Mellis's. So back to David Mellis. Um, right. David Mellis's uh, 2G phone. And that's such a great uh, phone to learn on because you solder all 156 components onto wow. the board and use the reflow oven. And I mean, it's, you, you can solder it all by hand, but I prefer to use the reflow oven for most of the components. And then, you know, soldering the rest of them on by hand, the larger components. Tell us more about this David Mellis. You mentioned yes, it before. So, so David Mellis, uh, was from MIT and he is actually one of the five founders of the Arduino board. He is oh. one of the lesser known founders of the Arduino board, but he creates his own magic. So he was at MIT for a while. He did the 2G uh, DIY phone, uh, developed that and produced, you know, spread spread that goodness to to the world. Uh, he is now in Berkeley, and I believe he's an instructor there. So, ah, yeah. Cool. I just found his MIT Media Lab profile. We can yes. So this is how you spell it if people want to go look into this. Thank <laughs> you for pulling that up. So, and I think, does this also have the DIY phone link There's on it? There's lots of like do-it-yourself devices type of thing. This might be mm -hmm. a little bit older. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, yes, oh, there it is. That. There it is. Oh, yes. I love that display. Yes. And so he uh, updated the design. So you can do the LED display and then you can also do a liquid crystal display. Oh, so so cool. when I made it the first time, I did the liquid crystal display uh, mm -hmm. just to get more familiar um, with LCDs. And I learned so much from that cell phone and I'm so grateful that he uh, brought it to the world. So 
And it looks like this collab with Leah Bukley, maybe, who's super cool. Or Bukley. <laughs> I should know that. But <laughs> yeah. So now you have this newer version and you have this awesome picture of the PCB. So you've gone from uh, working with the Seed Refone kit and the Adafruit Phona kit and uh, David Mellis's designs. And now you have your own amazing PCB. Uh, and it runs Android 10? And yes, Android 10. PRG? Yes, and we have over 400 components wow. <laughs> on the Circle Phone 2.0. Uh, and we've had to rebrand it. People were like, why are you advertising it as the Circle Phone 4G LTE with Android 10? <laughs> because it seems outdated. But ours has a lot of the newer technology on it. And so mm. we're really proud to offer that, you know, with the freeform windows and a lot of the advancements that we have made to the Android 10, in addition to having the two headphone jacks and we have a contactless infrared temperature sensor on the Whoa, top cool. next to the sense next to the selfie camera. So that's been really exciting to play with especially yeah. with COVID and everything going on. So I was frustrated because when COVID first broke out in China, before it even made it here to the United States, mm. I was always perturbed. You know, they were always taking everybody's temperature, but it's frustrating to me that somebody else would know my temperature before I would. You know, yeah. kind of thing like, I, I want to know my yourself. temperature. Yeah, I want to know yeah. my temperature myself, you know, with the contactless uh, thermometers. And even the contactless uh, thermometer that we have at home, we have actually have two and we use for our kids. But like, if I have to take my own temperature, like I have mm -hmm. to stand in the mirror, you know, and when you're sick, you just want to be in bed. And so yeah. like, uh, it's really inconvenient. But having it next to the selfie camera to be able to right. align your face in that camera and then take your temperature and, and know that temperature first before somebody else knows it, I think is super valuable. That's really I think, interesting. I think it'll have more applications beyond COVID, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if I could keep one of them looking at my tea all the time, <laughs> no wonder if yes. I be nice. Um, yes. Tell us more about the camera that's on the phone. Yes, so really proud to have our selfie camera is actually a 13 megapixel selfie camera. That's actually mm. better than the ones on the iPhones. Nice. <laughs> so um, to keep costs down, we did put the same camera on the front and the back because mm -hmm. uh, that lowers the bomb cost uh, oh, yeah. for our customers. Uh, the 13 having the 13 megapixel on the back is sufficient for taking you know we you can take that panoramic photo you can take um the portrait photo um all of those yeah. uh photos that that you want to take um are available still with that 13 megapixel um so we're really excited about the quality of the cameras that we have uh, they have Sony technology inside of them, and um, we're really happy to have those. What is uh, the most expensive component on the phone? That's a really good question. Mm. The SOM. Oh. So, yes, the SOM is the most expensive. Piece. So the system on module, the like central processor of the phone, mm -hmm. that kind of makes sense. So mm -hmm. in order to run Android 10 smoothly and nicely, I suppose you need to have a pretty high powered processor. Mm-hmm. Mm. Definitely. Uh, I'd like to come back to one of these questions that we hit during the lightning round. Um, yes. You said that some of your most value, you love going to maker fairs and stuff, but some of your most valuable conferences are like Mobile World Congress and CES. What are the sort of main things you get out of that? Is it uh, connections with people? Is it you learn about what else people are doing or where to source components or yeah, what do you? Mm -hmm. So I was trained early to always line up my meetings <laughs> before oh, I go yeah. to those conferences. Those conferences are really about meeting people face to face. And so even before we had booths, I always had my meetings lined up uh, for CES CES has always been a personal passion of mine. Mm. So since I was a kid, you know, that's where all of the computers were first <laughs> debuted. And so to me, that was a big geek fest, but, but it's kind of 
transitioned over the years and opened up. So it's more like 13 different conferences in the same conference. So Ooh. you'll have the track for sports. You'll have the track for um, right. TV and media. You'll have the track for femtech. You'll have the track for um, home Smart security. And, yeah, mm -hmm. and wearables and all this stuff. Absolutely. And so because of that, you can attend all of these, you know, trainings or seminars or uh, presentations on all of this cutting edge, edge technology. And I love it. But the most cutting edge technology is actually in the basement yeah. of Eureka Park yeah. of, of the Sands uh, Convention Center. And that is, I love, love, love going to every booth that's in the Eureka Park. So Eureka Park has about 4,000 booths. <laughs> and there are, gosh, I don't know, are there like 20,000 booths throughout CES? But like the, the highest density or the highest concentration of booths is actually in Eureka Park because it's all these tiny startup booths. And it's all of this technology that you'll see the next year on the main floor, yeah. so um, the ones that survive. So mm -hmm. you get, as a startup, you're allowed to be in Eureka Park for only two years. Oh, After two years, you have to go, you either have to grow or, or be gone. So, mm -hmm. so, and then you move up to the uh, booths, which are on the next floor. So Eureka Park, the booths uh, start at 2,500 and, on the main floor, they start at 10,000. And then in the huge Las Vegas Convention Center, which is which is a full tram ride away from the Sands Convention Center. So they have mm -hmm. two convention centers. Uh, and they've had to expand the Las Vegas Convention Center to the hotels, which are <laughs> which surround it. Mm. Like some, like you can, uh, I think last, Last time I went, uh, you could cross this um, sky bridge to go to the neighboring uh, hotel and then go see even more booths over there. Wow. But yeah, it was it's just so massive. So, it, but so in the good. Las Vegas Convention Center, those booths probably start at a hundred thousand dollars per booth. So that's where you see LG, Samsung. Um, Sony, you know, all of the really large companies are mm -hmm. over there. And then you also see boat companies. So ah. they have huge displays of like boats and car companies. They have huge displays of cars or, uh, or audio for cars. So, you know, they'll have the vehicles there and then you can like uh, test out the audio in, right. in vehicles. So yeah. And you've also been interviewed by the BBC at CES. So you've yes. got these interfaces with people and with, you know, major media outlets because everyone goes there. Yes. And thank you for showing. So this uh, picture that you're showing right here is our is 2020 uh, enclosure. And honestly, we had, um, we had a mechanical engineer not deliver in time for CES. So that's actually the enclosure that I just threw together like, oh, in no. five days before oh, wow. our booth. Yeah. So, you know, it's not the most beautiful enclosure, but it protected the device so that people could actually interact with the software in our booth. So we had five of those units, evaluation units for people to play with and um, people could put them in their pockets or take selfies yeah. with them. So we had so many people take a selfie picture with uh, our nice. phones yeah, we and we have a big collage of um, ha, 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 cool. some of those photos. Yeah, it looks so good. And this is I love it. You, you didn't have the optimal enclosure, but you had the one that worked and that yes. enabled you to get on the BBC talking about your product. It's so cool. Yes. And, you know, uh, you showed the clock uh, when she was showing the clock and the numbers were. Clear. So we've done a lot with the software since oh, that yeah. booth so that we don't have any of that clipping. So, um, sure. yeah, when I see that, I'm like, oh, yeah, that was a problem. <laughs> like, <laughs> Thank goodness we don't have that anymore. You know, like each each day you try to improve just a little bit more. And so right. you forget, like, you know, what it was like 
Mm. Uh, then. So one of the, uh, speaking of the software, one of the exciting things that Addison Karolik did, she is actually, she came in on as our CTO this year. Mm. So she moved, as you could see, the status bar is at the top, but she moved in the uh, right and the left part of the status bar so that the bits that you would normally oh. see in the corners are actually moved in and a little bit lower. So That's they're- cool they're almost kind of in this curvature. And we previously before Android 10, because we actually started uh, developing this phone when we had Android 8. Mm -hmm. And then we worked through Android 9. And in Android 9, we still had the three buttons at the bottom. Right. And so we brought those three buttons in so that you could access them very easily in the round display. But now we have gestures uh, with Android 10. Gestures yeah. is... Um, so we've turned uh, gestures on by default because most people are used to the oh, gestures now. That's so interesting so, how that really um, enables your... Yes, and so if you pull up on the screen, then you right. can get the overview. And um, if you wanna go back, so for example, we have the arrows. I don't know if you can see the arrow. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah. the arrow. So if you wanna go back, then you can use the arrows uh, to go back and forth. So on the sides, which is really great because like having the circle phone and having the arrows on the sides and depending on where you touch the screen, the arrow will appear closer to where you touch the screen with your finger. So um, yeah, it oh, modifies yeah. based on your behavior. Nice. And uh, we're coming to the end here, but there, I wanted to throw mm -hmm. something else in there. You're talking about doing constant develop, constant like, development, constantly sort of up grading what you can offer. And one of the things that I saw on your blog that you talked about with that is that both accessories and the warranty are sort of order based. Like, so if you get to 50,000 orders, then you can get a warranty. If you get to a thousand, uh, for every 1000 orders, it says we're able to add one more accessory to the box. Uh, mm -hmm. So there really is this sort of like a growth oriented approach. And the more mm -hmm. that the more orders you get, the more you can do. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, definitely. So one of the hardest things in a hardware startup and speaking to the hackster.io crowd, mm. I think it's really important to touch on this. When you start your hardware startup, the first thousand units are the hardest to get to and they're the most expensive. But once you cross that thousand or even five thousand unit mark and hopefully if you can cross that 10,000 unit mark, then you can start investing not only in a better quality product, but more accessories, uh, more features for the consumer, and also more team members to be able to support the product. So uh, being able to cross those thresholds, whether it's the thousand unit, the, the zero to a thousand is, is really, uh, tricky to get to. And most hardware companies have investment for that. Our company has not had any investment. And so because mm. of that, we're, we're always on a shoestring. But um, once you get past that thousand, it really uh, helps a lot in making a better product and uh, growing your team. And of course, that's partly why Kickstarter became a thing. And your Kickstarter, you like, even when I reached out to you a little while ago, you'd already recently passed your $10,000 goal. You're already well over that. And uh, you've got a whole month left to go. So that's very exciting. You've got all these perks that people can dig through. Uh, Thank what's you. The... Yes, obviously. So people we're actually, right now, we're working to, towards our 25,000 stretch goal. And uh -huh. what that means is that people can actually get not only will they have the dual headphone jacks, but they'll have dual sets of headphones to plug into the right. unit. So delivered with the unit. So. And that's one of your pledge tiers as well, is that if you pledge $25 or more, then you get two pairs of super bass stereo headphones on here. Exactly, cool. exactly. And we really like those because uh, they have the Android features where you can fast forward uh, oh. You can skip a song or go back a song or, you know, pause, those kinds of things. So that's really cool. And then, of course, if you get to those 1000 extra orders, you get more accessories. If you get to the 50,000 orders and you can get warranties and stuff. That's so cool. Yes. Ah, is there anything else you'd like to throw in before we wrap up here? 
No, just that I used to be a hackster ambassador, and I guess I still am because I'm super the passionate. Kind of left. <laughs> I, I know the program, especially uh, being in lockdown, um, yeah. we just haven't been able to meet in person, but being able to offer this live hackster cafe is such a benefit to those of us in lockdown. Thank you for hosting this and thank you for having me on your show. It's absolutely my favorite part of the week. Thank you for joining us so much. And thank you everyone for watching and chiming in with your comments. Uh, we'll see you soon and hack on. Hack